Good morning, everyone. I'm Anna with the Radiology Registrars, and I'm going to be talking about chest ultrasound techniques. Um, as Dr. Nesby said, the physics lecture was supposed to be before mine, so if there's any bits of physics that you don't understand, it will be clarified afterwards. Right. So just some practical considerations first. Make sure that you review the clinical indication for the scan that you're doing first. Make sure that the scan is appropriate and relevant. It's always important to review previous imaging because this gives you a clue about the site, the size and the <coughs> pathology. Don't forget to enter the patient's name and date of birth on the screen. Make sure that appropriate ultrasound probes are available. So as you'll be learning in the physics lecture, the different ultrasound probes are appropriate for scanning different parts of the body. And all these probes may not be uh, plugged into the system at the same time. So make sure the ones you need are plugged into the um, ultrasound machine. Uh, for chest, we usually start with a 2 to 5 megahertz ultrasound probe. And then if you want to see any bits of the chest wall or the pleural detail, we use a linear 5 to 10 megahertz probe. So make sure these are plug plugged in into the system. And if you press the transducer button, uh, you uh, can select the probe you want onto the screen. Once you've done that, you'll get options of preset programs. So if you select the chest preset program, the machine will optimize the image uh, for you when you're looking at chest structures. So once you've done all that, uh, make sure you have lots of ultrasound jelly and lots of tissue paper. Um, and now viewing conditions. So when we perform our ultrasounds in our uh, darkened ultrasound rooms, we have the luxury of having very good viewing conditions. But unfortunately, you may not um, if you're doing the scan in ITU or in A&E or in the ward. So to make life easier for yourself, just dim the lights and close the curtains and try and optimize your viewing conditions as far as possible. So your scan is going to take at least 15 to 20 minutes depending on what you're scanning. So you want to be comfortable, you want your patient to be comfortable. So make sure you adjust the height of the patient's bed, make sure you adjust your own seat. Uh, the ultrasound machine can go up and down as well, and the screen swivels uh, from side to side. So take advantage of all that. Most chest uh, patients are actually more comfortable sitting up, so you can have them sitting up. Some may be more comfortable supine. The basic technique, so for chest ultrasound classically, we have the patient semi-recumbent or sitting up, uh, with his arms in front of him or behind his head. Um, we uh, use the intercostal spaces to scan, and uh, for, the post for the posterior aspect of the chest, we scan from the back. Uh, for the lateral aspect of the chest, we keep the patient in decubitus and scan there, and um, we scan from the front for the front of the chest in a supine position. So uh, the basic steps are to identify the liver on the right and the spleen on the left, and then the diaphragm, and, and as I said, use the intercostal spaces. Optimize your image. So again, you'll hear more about that in the physics lecture. Uh, three buttons are important, the focus, the gain, and the depth. So the depth button, um, you can increase the depth to see deeper structures or reduce it to see the more superficial uh, structures like the chest wall and pleura. Um, the focus button, this is again very important. You have to bring the focus down to the area of interest and that, that's where you'll get the best image. The gain button, again, um, is very useful. It, uh, you can adjust it to improve image contrast. So once you've done all that, remember the chest x-ray findings and target the chest using the x-ray finding. So and um, we, we, what we need to do is we need to examine in deep and quiet respiration. And then sniffing and coughing I'll go into later on. Uh, additional techniques are um, scanning in the suprasternal position. Um, this is used for assessment of the mediastinum. So to look for mediastinal masses, for example. And if you put the color on, then you can differentiate mediastinal masses from the great vessels. Scanning in the subcostal position allows you to evaluate the pericardium. Remember, take your time, especially when you're just starting out. So these are the probes I was talking about. The first one is the one that we uh, use commonly. It's the 2 to 5 megahertz curvilinear probe. Uh, because it has lower frequency, you can see deeper structures. And the sector scan allows you to see a wide field of view through a narrow acoustic window. The second probe is used if you want to look at the chest wall or the pleura in more detail. It's a higher frequency, so it uh, allows um, um, you to look in more detail at superficial structures. 
So this is just an example of what you would see with a curvilinear uh, 2 to 5 megahertz probe. You can see an effusion there with some particles, some epigenic material within it, but you can't see more detail than that. And here um, you can see that this is with the linear probe, you can see more detail. Uh, you can see some, um, again, echogenic septations, inoculations, and some particles. <coughs> so uh, it's useful to have a mental checklist um, of what to do. So identify the diaphragm, the liver, and the spleen, as I said. Look for diaphragmatic movement. So I'll come to that later on. Pleura. Now, when you're looking at the pleura, as here with the linear probe, you can see uh, the chest wall structures right at the top. Um, and then you can see the two layers of pleura and the fluid within. So when you're looking at the pleura, see, to look, see, see if it's thickened. Is it irregular? Does it have any nodules in it? Then the lung. Now the normal lung can't be seen because it's full of air and so there's a very uh, big difference between the acoustic impedance of the chest wall and the lung and that causes all the ultrasound waves to be reflected back so you can't see the normal lung. However, if the lung's full of inflammatory material, pus, fluid, then you can see it and you'll see it as an echogenic structure which moves through the respiration. If it's consolidated, you might see echogenic branching structures which represent air bronchograms. Uh, so now pleural fluid, it's very important to look at uh, pleural fluid carefully. See is it, partic is it clear or does it have particles within it? Does it have echogenic loculations or septations within it? Now, these things are important because they do have clinical relevance. Transudates uh, are invariably are clear fluids, they're anechoic. Whereas if a, a collection has particles, echogenic uh, septations, it's more likely to be an exudate. Empyemas are more likely to have loculations and septations. So remember to take images of abnormal pack findings. Here's just some examples of some uh, normal structures. So you can see the liver here and the normal spleen. The echogenic line at the bottom, that's the diaphragm. The normal left kidney and spleen. The normal right kidney. And this is actually a lots of ultrasound scans which have been sewn together to form a panoramic view of the, of the ribs. And you can see the ribs with the dark posterior acoustic shadowing between them, uh, behind them. Okay, now here's some examples of pathology. So you can see the liver and then the <coughs> diaphragm at the bottom. And then on the other side, you can see the pleural fluid, which is black or anechoic. And this is uh, quite a good slide. It gives you, it shows you the difference between ascites and um, effusion. So you can see uh, the spleen, which is surrounded by the uh, dark ascitic fluid. And then you can see the diaphragm. And on the other side of the diaphragm is the pleural effusion. <coughs> so this slide just shows you the importance of correctly identifying the diaphragm. I don't have a pointer, but this is not the diaphragm, basically. That's, this is a splenic hematoma, the darker part is a, is a hematoma within the spleen. So um, it's very important, if you, if you thought that was the diaphragm, then you would think maybe that's an infusion. So coming to diaphragmatic movement, as I said, it's important to observe the movement of the diaphragm in quiet and deep respiration. Not, the normal diaphragm should move down with inspiration and up with expiration. If it does the opposite, that's paradoxical movement, and um, that uh, is seen in diaphragmatic paralysis or conditions like flail chest. The sniff test is used to confirm the diagnosis of diaphragmatic paralysis. So the patient's asked to take a brisk sniff, and if the diaphragm moves up rather than down, that's indicative of diaphragmatic paralysis. So ultrasound is uh, now routinely used for uh, marking the spot for um, insertion of pleural drains and for various ultrasound guided procedures. So when you're marking the spot uh, for a, a, a pleural drain, um, make sure that your patient and you are both comfortable. And then the most important thing that you must remember is that the 
the spot, the, the position that you mark the spot in should be the same as the position that, the, that your colleague will be putting the drain in. So if your colleague is going to put the drain in with the patient sitting like this, then you need to scan in that position and you need to mark the patient in that position. It's very useful to um, give uh, some distances for, the, for your colleague. So here I have an example. So um, you can the two stars over there, you can, that's the depth of the front. So if you, from here to here, you can, this is the depth from the skin, basically the distance from the skin. And from here to here is basically the depth of the infusion. So um, ultrasound guidance is very useful for um, uh, draining small effusions and loculated effusions safely, and also for pleural and peripheral lung biopsies. So when you're performing a procedure under ultrasound guidance, check, first of all, your probe orientation. Remember to keep your probe still. <coughs> Don't look for the needle. Keep your probe in the same position and then move the needle so that you can see it with the probe at the same place. And of course, practice makes perfect. So extra equipment that you might need while uh, performing an ultrasound guided procedure. So needles with um, echo tips, basically um, they make it easier for you to see the tip of the needle. And uh, probe covers and sterile gel just to keep the procedure sterile. Uh, so I'm sure you all know there are limitations of ultrasound. Um, your examination can be limited if your patient's obese, edematous, if he has um, cutaneous emphysema, or if he's immobile and he can't follow your instructions, he can't take deep breaths uh, for you. So just uh, some tips on uh, when you get stuck and you feel like you can't see anything, go back to the basics, uh, make sure you've chosen the right transducer, make sure you've chosen the right preset, adjust your depth, gain and focus buttons, and if you still can't see anything, get help from a sonographer or a radiologist. If you've got the picture but you don't know what you're looking at, then take lots of pictures and um, you, hopefully you can show somebody later on. That's useful. Thank you.